Hi, I'm Mr. Russell, one of your librarians in the Lee Summit North High School Library. And in this short video, we're going to talk about source evaluation out on the free web. So here we go. Learning targets for today, pretty easy. Um, can you effectively establish source credibility if you're looking for a source? The big question is, are you using the right tool? Uh, if you're out on the free web, is that the right place for you? Uh, for the kind of research that you are doing. I will suggest that if you are doing academic research, you might want to watch Mr. Miller's ELA 10 Research Library Resources, where he kind of breaks down a lot of our databases and other sources that we pay a lot of money for, where a lot of the source evaluation has already been done for you. But you might find yourself in a situation where you need to go out onto the free web. So the question then becomes, how do you know who to trust? There's a lot of stuff out there, right? Some questionable information, and you need to figure out, are you willing to stake your academic reputation on a source from the free web? So there are ways to do that, and that's what we're going to look at in this video. So let's say that you have to take a ride somewhere. Uh, you need to get from point A to point B, and you have a couple choices in front of you. There's the puppy van with free candy and a, and a clown. Or there's the Kansas City streetcar, which is new and shiny and, and takes a lot of people to a lot of places. Obviously, I'm hoping that you're kind of looking with a little suspicion at that clown car, at the, at the, at the rundown van. We, by our nature, I think human nature, tend to judge things. And I'm hoping uh, that when you look at web resources, you do much the same as you did when you looked at these two images uh, and thought, which one do you want to take a ride in? I'm hoping that you went for the, uh, the, the streetcar, which if you haven't ridden that, that's pretty cool. Uh, well, now, uh, once we're through with COVID, of course. So let's give a hypo hypothetical example. Maybe your teacher has assigned you just uh, a project and you have chosen Martin Luther King as part of your project and you need some sources on Martin Luther King. Great guy, you know who he is, you know some of the history, uh, civil rights leader, etc. So possibly, your first instinct might be to go out to Google. You know, that happens. So let's say you do that. You type in Dr. Martin, and of course, on Google, it immediately suggests, do you mean this? Do you mean this? Do you mean this? So we're just doing Martin Luther King Jr. And it gives us some results. So here's one from Wikipedia. There's biography, or this is the Nobel Prize, rather, biography.com. All of those might have some, some reasonable resources, some news, some general stats. And then we're going to look at the one right here. And this, is again, is the, the top of the list that Google suggested, martinlutherking.org. So the question is, just by its surface, is a .org a good website? Is something you could trust? So we're going to pause just a second, come back to Martin Luther King in a moment, and talk about the differences in dots. Uh, what follows that dot? dot .org, dot .gov, dot .net, dot .com, edu, tv, us, uk. There are more, but those are the common ones. What I want you to do is think about what do each of those extensions mean and who can get each of those. So I'm going to pause. I'm going to put up a slide here to say pause, let you think about that, and hit play once you've kind of figured out what each of those means and who can get one. So, .org is an organization, uh, .net, .com, .tv, .us, .uk, all of those anybody can get. I could go out and create biology.tv. It's probably already taken, but if it's not, I could create bi biology.tv, but I would not be a very authoritative source for a biology website because I just don't know that much. That's not my background. I skipped biology in high school, to be honest. The only two on this list that really have any sort of requirement are .gov, where you have to be a government agency, .edu, you have to be tied to some sort of a school, a college, a university, Lee Summit R7, for instance. .uk, you need a, a, a British street address. So you could rent a P.O. box in London, probably, and get a .uk. So we'll come back to .gov at the end of the presentation. Um, but knowing that anybody out there in the world can get a .org, would you have any suspicions, without even seeing the website yet, about MartinLutherKing.org? I think the correct answer is, yeah, 
uh, be, be a little suspicious. You want to know what's behind it. So here is what that website looks like, or at one point looked like. And this was just a year or so ago when I got this screenshot, and I've used this example for many, many years. As you glance at it, you're probably thinking, oh, it's not very, uh, very up to date. It looks rather old. You might immediately see things like rap lyrics, why the King holiday should be repealed, which might raise some red, red flags right off the bat, right? Um, why would a site about Martin Luther King that you would expect to be very um, respectful or uh, really celebrate martinluthercking.org suggest that the King holiday should be repealed? There are some other things on there that might catch your eye. And so you might wonder who is really behind this. Well, there's a way that you can figure out, even if it doesn't say, find out more about us. Because even then, remember that if you own the website, you can put whatever you want out there. It doesn't have to be true. So who is .NET? And some other uh, examples down here basically work for the business world. If you want to start a website and know if anybody has martinlutherking.org, you go to one of these who is generators. And to get a page on the World Wide, World Wide Web, uh, you have to register that. This searches that registry. So when you copy and paste martinlutherking.org into whois.net or any of these others, you get some results back. What we found was martinlutherking.org is run by a man named Don Black, organization of Stormfront in Palm Beach, Florida. A simple Google search within just a few seconds if you don't know anything about Stormfront or Don Black, will tell you that Mr. Black is the former head of the KKK. He worked for the American Nazi Party and Socialist White People's Party. He hung out with Jerry Ray, who is the brother of James Earl Ray, if that name sounds familiar. familiar James Earl Ray uh, assassinated Martin Luther King on uh, April 4th, 1968. So the, the man who started the website, martinlutherking.org, hangs out with the brother of the man who shot and killed Martin Luther King. So would you stake your academic reputation on a website, martinlutherking.org, knowing those facts? Hopefully not. I think that really changes the perspective, right? This is a kind of a hardcore example of uh, a website that has really been designed to fool you, to give you information that is uh, under the guise of something completely different. Obviously not all websites are like this. This is a, a drastic example, but it's a real example. And that's why we need to do source evaluation to figure out if this is something worth using, uh, worth staking your academic reputation to. So there are other ways, let's say the, um, who is search doesn't yield any results because there are ways companies can pay like $10 a month, absolutely nothing. And the uh, organization will just put up a kind of a brick wall and you won't get their personal information that you won't be able to see that it's stormfront dot black. There are other ways. So another way is the link feature. So if you type in the URL link colon, drop in that URL, you will see what other organizations are linking to it. So other groups uh, include white supremacists. Um, there are some hoax websites and some other things that kind of suggest that that website might not be on the level even without figuring out that it's run by a former clan member. So those are a couple of tools that you can use for source credibility. There is a much bigger test though that is really good to use and that is the crap test. And I want you to pause here in just a second. Uh, if you haven't already been taking notes, or if your teacher is asking you to uh, fill out a Google form or something to show that you actually watched this video, now is a good time to pause and make sure you've got something to write all of this information down. So the CRAP test, that stands for currency, relevance, authority, accuracy, and purpose. And if you didn't catch that, obviously you can either pause or we will talk about each one as we go through. So the first one, currency, is it relevant 
to right now? Is the information up to date? And is that important? Because let's say um, you're studying, uh, researching something about a migrant caravan coming up uh, to the United States through Mexico. That information changes minute by minute, perhaps. If you're studying uh, something about Millard Fillmore, our 13th president, that information hasn't changed in a great long time. Uh, so the currency of that information will be a little bit different. So things to look for. Can you find out when the information was published? Has it been updated? Uh, if it has been updated and if there are links, do those links work? Um, because sometimes seeing little mistakes like that might be an indication that there is a bigger problem. Relevance. Does it matter to what you're looking for? Uh, is it at an appropriate level? Kind of the Goldilocks test. Is it too easy? Is it too hard? Are you comfortable citing this in your research? Is it authoritative? Is the author an expert? If you're doing something about theoretical physics and have a choice between Stephen Hawking and Malcolm Gladwell, uh, again, if you don't know those guys, you could Google them real quick and figure out that Stephen Hawking is one of the world's preeminent, or was one of the world's preeminent, theoretical physicists, where Malcolm Gladwell is a phenomenal author and speaker, but maybe not an expert in theoretical physics. So things to look for in authority. Uh, look for the author's credentials. Is the author writing about a subject which she or he has a background in? Or are they a writer for a news magazine trained as a journalist talking to people who hopefully know what they're talking about? Uh, and again, back to the, the dot, does the URL reveal anything? Is it a .edu, cambridge.edu versus something.tv could be telling as to what their credentials are and if they are worth uh, trusting your academic reputation to. Is the information accurate? The second A. First A is authority, second A is accuracy. Is it right? Um, you know, in a social media driven world, it's really easy to forward something. You know, you want to be the first to, to tell people, did you hear about this? And sometimes that could just be wrong. And so it is worth triangulating that data, figuring out, can you find this in other places that are reliable and that um, make sense? So you quite often will, will hear about people forwarding things that they've seen on social media without really checking it out. And then they find out, oh, that, that wasn't really true. Uh, these things uh, just kind of make you look silly uh, looking back. Accuracy, so things to look for. Peer reviewed, have other experts in that field looked at that? Uh, are there citations? Is there evidence that supports information in the article? Again, triangulating that data, can you find it multiple places? Is the language and tone unbiased? Or is it something where they're really trying to move you into a certain point of view? Are there spelling, grammar, typographical errors? Those to me, again, suggest if, if you're not getting your grammar right, if you're not spelling things correctly, you might not be paying as close attention to the facts and uh, providing good quality information. Those are all red flags for me. And the last one in the crap test is purpose. Why does this information exist? So using that Martin Luther King example again, what's the purpose of that? That, in my opinion, is designed to sway your opinion about Martin Luther King. Things to look for in purpose. Uh, what's the intent? Is it to entertain, to sell, to inform, uh, to convince, to, to sway you to a certain point of view? Is there an obvious point of view? And how much bias can you identify? Uh, something to be aware of. If you are using popular media, then there probably is bias. If you look at the exact same story, so here are news reports filed a little over a year ago from when I'm filming this in September 2020. This is from August 2019. Three reporters from three different publications at the exact same event. It was a rally in Portland, Oregon. And you can see by the headlines, they kind of have different spins. Uh, the Huffington Post is widely known as a, a left-leaning publication. BBC News is considered very right down the middle. Uh, and the town hall is considered uh, something that leans right or, or more conservative. And so each of those has their own take on what uh, that same event is. 
So it's worth knowing if you are pulling an article from, say, the Christian Science Monitor, what political leaning, what reporting lean does that media organization have? There is a uh, publication called All Science. It's a website. Their motto is don't be fooled by media bias and fake news. Unbiased news doesn't exist. And as a former television news broadcaster myself, I have to agree. And I think uh, as you look through all sides, it is pretty easy to see that they have gone through and rated all sorts of different news organizations, hundreds and hundreds of them, all the way from really far left to really far right, based on the things that they have published. So uh, as you scroll through, for instance, ABC News is considered left-leaning. CNN News leans left. Fox News leans right. Fox News opinion leans heavy right. CNN opinion leans heavy left. So when you head in to do your research, it's good to know how those organizations lean, just what that bias is. That doesn't necessarily make it a bad source, but knowing that bias can help you see that information through a reasonable filter. So we're going to pause just for a second, and I want you to answer these questions. Okay. .gov. I promised earlier we would circle back to .gov, and there is a lot of good information here. So, .govs can be anything from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, the National Park Service, NASA, NOAA, the, the Weather Service, Department of Agriculture, the EPA. Depending on what you're researching, you can find a treasure trove of good data in government websites. Now, in our politically charged culture, especially right now, we're uh, a month or so away from an election when I'm recording this, a presidential election in 2020. It is easy to think that government websites uh, might be scary places, that politicians are doing all sorts of, of evil things to, to these uh, websites. And honestly, most government workers at these agencies are not political. They're scientists, they're researchers, they're just there doing their thing. These are agencies that are headed by political appointees. Now, whitehouse.gov, certainly that content changes based on the occupant of the White House. The current occupant has a much different approach, and um, the, the content of whitehouse.gov is very different than the last occupant had because they have different agendas. That is not a surprise. Um, but the data that you can pull from a lot of these websites is valid and can be very accurate and very good uh, sources of information. Sometimes it's just a lot. I mean, there could be 200 million pages of things to sort through. So knowing how to use those um, can be good and good sources of information. One other thing to think about uh, are local resources. Here, uh, Lee Summit uh, and the Kansas City metro area, there are government uh, agencies and, and governments that collect data, the city of Lee Summit, city of Kansas City, Missouri, as well as a lot of history museums. So we are, we are lucky to have the National World War I Museum. Uh, the Kansas City Museum has some good data, the Nelson Atkins, uh, it's not on here as a link, but they have some uh, interesting archives as well. The National Archives has a branch in Kansas City down by Union Station, a fascinating place to visit. Harry S. Truman Library has some data, obviously, from the Truman era. Also consider mo.gov, a lot of state data that you can pull for various research pro uh, projects. And Missouri Digital Heritage, also uh, a, an interesting website to check out that you might be able to use for your research. So a little bit about um, open web sources uh, to use and lots of other information there about figuring out whether you can trust your uh, specific source out on the free web and source evaluation. So just a reminder, this video, lots of others, including Mr. Miller's presentation about all of those research databases and other things found on our Lisa the North High School Library website, the research page, uh, video on that, and so much else on our YouTube channel, uh, LSN Libraries, where you can find us there. And there's our website if you're not already on our Lee Summit North Library webpage. That's it. Good luck. Let us know if we can help.